Forcing you to hear the word no actually helps you become better at hearing no. Oh, we all knew that. But we're going to dive into some pretty cool things, including where does the sale really begin? There we go. We are back, my friends. Apologize for the sneakiness of the chair. Um, all right, so we're on part number two. We're not going to get through all of part number two because it's absolutely monstrous in this book of when they say no from Richard Fenton and Andrea Waltz. And y'all know Andrea, she's been on the show many times and confirmed yesterday that when we're done this book, we're actually gonna have both Richard and Andrea on to talk about it. So what I wanted to talk to you about today is a topic that I hear more and more about, and um, in hearing more about it, I've often believed, and, and kind of at the start of this book, it was one of those things where they uh, they catch you on that off guard, I guess, is what I'm going to say. So what I mean by that, to kind of lay it out for everyone, is, um, you know, in sales, right? I'm sure you've all heard the analogy in sales. Well, no, when no is just the beginning of a the sale or no is not a no, it's a maybe, right? And I believe in sales, some no's are no's. But I also believe in sales that some no's are just a don't bother me right now. Not necessarily a no for now, but don't bother me right now, wrong time. And in this chapter, part two, when they say no, it says, when they say no, you're actually just getting. And when I first read um, this beginning of it, I was like, oh, I don't know if this is going to resonate with me. And then, it, then at the end of the first page of it, it says, the sale doesn't start until after the first no. Everything until then is getting to the starting line. I started to say, okay, well, let's dive a little bit into this. And what? And, and here's my perception of what Richard and Andrew mean by the starting line, right? The starting line is you have a choice. You can choose to learn or you can choose to move on. You can choose, choose to explore. Like, like all of these choices come to us at the starting line of our students, right? So some interesting things here. And one of the first things that Andrew and Richard say is when you hear no, you take responsibility for the no, right? So the customer response when you when the typical sales person's response is like to whose fault it is that says no they say typically it's the customer the customer's responsible of course they said no they said it not me even if it is true this is not the mindset of top for performers instead top performers take the responsibility for the no and they wonder what did i miss is there anything i said or didn't say that that created this no, but I have done better or differently. Now, Rich and Andrew are going to explain that you're using the word I instead of projecting it out to somebody else, right? And I can remember when I was about five years into my sales career, um, immediately, like when I first started in logistics, and some of you might feel the same way. You know, when I when I first started, I had this feeling of almost being a telemarketer, if that makes sense, right? Where I just I was looking at what I do, and I, I never really thought of value in it. And I was always of this opinion that you know, like, oh man, like, what do I really do for money? Like, I'm a broker. I'm I'm the middleman. I make a couple of phone calls. I make a couple of arrangements. I I put a I put a truck in location here, and I, and I make money. And I, I, at first. I always thought it was weird because I came from, you know, the construction industry from, um, I was out in BC doing residential industrial construction where literally for like eight hours, you got a jackhammer and you're tied into a post and you're leaning over the side of this hole you're cutting in the 17th floor that goes all the way down to the bottom because it's what the elevator is eventually going to go in, right? And I mean, you're holding this jackhammer like it, for hours after the day, your body's just shaking from the vibration. And I was making like eight bucks an hour or something. And I came into logistics and all of a sudden before I know it, I'm 17 years old making over a hundred grand a year. And so that jump 
for me, that mentality of it was was crazy, right? So when it's just, you know, then I started to dive into this really understanding and believing in what I was doing. And I can remember vividly my vice president of sales walked in my office one day and I was on a sales call. And this was the first time it was actually ever pointed out to me. And the first time that really became a reality. And he walked in the office and he was just kind of waiting for me to get off the phone. And I was, it, the call wasn't going well. And I hung up the phone. Yes, Mark. And he, something just clicked. I don't know if it ever happened to you before. You know, you're in, you're in a conversation with somebody and you got this issue in your head. And, and I'm, I, you know, I mean, a challenge you're trying to work out in your head. Let me rephrase that. Um, and then all of a sudden, it's like somebody saying something and it sparks the answer. All right. Have you ever been there? So I looked at him. I said, you're going to have to give me one second. I'm really sorry for interrupting. I picked up the phone and I dialed this person back and I said, hey, it's Dan again. Listen, I'd like another opportunity here because I obviously did not explain myself properly. I obviously missed something because there's no reason why we shouldn't move forward. I, I know ABCD. You need ABCD. So I've missed somewhere. I apologize. My bad. Let's move forward. And right in that second, we arranged another meeting to repitch. Re have a well at that point, yes, I thought it was a pitch. Let's call a spade a spade. Um, and I remember hanging up the phone, going, "Sorry about that." So, and Mark looked at me and he went, "Wow, I've never seen that before." He goes, "I was pretty cool." And I looked at it and I went, "Wow, like I do believe in what I'm doing, right?" And it was just, it was all subconsciously that this just happened. So. When they started talking about taking responsibility, what did I miss? Is there anything I said or I didn't say that created this? No. Or what could I have done differently? See? And then, so they, and they talk about high performers. They take responsibility for that. And here's the big takeaway for this take responsibility piece. Taking responsibility for the no forces you to learn from it and improve as a result. And this is something that I've been like talking about for years and preaching to every single rep I can preach to is every interaction we have to learn. Every interaction we have to either, you know, agree, disagree, but we have to move forward. There has to be an intention. All of this is mandatory for us as salespeople to truly live up to our own true potential and to truly escalate our own sales. I fully believe that. Then he gets into when they say no, it could be worse, right? Now, I love this. This part of the book is one of my favorite parts because Andrea and Richard say, when no, okay, so many salespeople think the worst the prospect can say is no, it's not. What is the worst thing? It's let me think about it. Why? Because the five word phrase poses these three problems. And, and here's something to really think about. So I'd like all of you to grab a pen and paper and really think about this for a sec. It deludes us into believing we're making progress when we're actually not. Love that. It is often a no in disguise. The prospect isn't really thinking about it. It's just their way of saying no without conflict. And the third one, let me think about it, makes it more challenging to Challenging to discover the hidden objections, a.k.a. the truth. Now, here's one thing that they also say. The top sales performers know that behind every no is the information needed to get to a yes. And even if it doesn't help this time with this prospect, the information may be helpful somewhere else down the road. The goal of any sales interaction is to get a decision, not necessarily a yes, but any decision, because any decision, positive or negative, is progress. Now, that to me is the gold that every salesperson watching and listening to this live right now or pre -record or recorded, you got to get there. That is where you need to be. Because when you do, your sales career will change. And what I mean by that is, I don't mean overnight, you're going to make four phone calls and land three deals. But what I mean is your mental side of sales is going to become so much more proficient. You're going to become so much better at the game 
because you're understanding and learning from every note. And the key there is maybe not this person, maybe not this sale, maybe not this call, but the next one, right? So I wrote down right beside all of these three things is how do you overcome? Let me think about it. And so that for me is something that I do believe we all need to start really working into our sales. And if you don't know how to overcome, let me think about it. If, if the let me think about it is a thing to you where it's like, okay, well, you know what, why don't we schedule another call? How long will it take you to think about it? Um, I suggest you sit down and really, really, really think about, it's a lot of thinking about it, um, what it is that you're good at, what you're missing on your calls. Because one thing that they, they go on here to say is, you know, when you, how could I phrase this to make it simple? Um, when you hear, let me think about it. When I hear that, I go right into the mode of what did I miss? Because here's one thing I do believe. And, and I'll put it to you this way. You present me the five main facts about what you're trying to sell me. I take all five of those and I apply my challenges against those five. And if they don't match, we're a no. But if I take those five challenges and apply my five challenges, and now all of a sudden we have a match, then it should be a yes. And I believe that to be the case, whether it be five, 10, three, two, whatever. I'm just using five because I have two hands and it matches evenly. I believe when we as sales reps present what we're doing, but let me, let me precursor that. There's got to be a need, right? So there's got to be a connection. There's got to be an ICP involved. But when you have that and then you say, okay, here's the issue. Here's my problem. Here's the issue. Here's my problem. Here's the issue. Here's my problem. Here's the issue or my solution. Here's my solution. Here's the issue. Here's my solution. They mend together perfectly and create something way stronger together than they are apart. It's a no brainer. So if at that point I hear, let me think about it, I sit back and I go, okay, I've done something wrong here. So it would be one of these questions where Mr. and Mrs. Prospect, like, did I do something wrong? No. Okay. Well, you have these five problems. I have these solutions that intertwine with those problems perfectly. And together, they become stronger. Solve your problems. Help you achieve your goals. I'm not understanding why there's, and I have to think about it. And as we get deeper into the book, they talk about, you know, do you have really, are you with the right decision maker and all those things? And we'll get into that a little later. But just something to think about when it comes to that. So, and the next one, and the, the final one that we're going to talk about today, I think, yes. Uh, no, actually, we're going to have, we have two more conversations today. Is, you know, a, a phrase, I guess, that's been thrown around quite a bit um, is value, 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 right? So what we're talking about here is finding the valuable value in the metric. This is one thing um, way before this book came out. When I first started training salespeople in a corporate environment, um, I looked at it and I said, you know, what metrics really matter? And, and when I look at metrics that matter, I look at what matters to a salesperson, right? I know the metrics that matter to a corporation, but what, what matters to a salesperson? And so what I did is I created probably <laughs> up until this point, it is probably my greatest feat as an Excel um, document. Um, I've seen many way better Excel documents for me personally, when it comes to Excel, I've never really excelled that Excel and I get that. Um, but what happened was, uh, I created this document and I was measuring things like calls, close, average account value, loads, increases, decreases, and all, and arbitrarily I was, sorry, let me rephrase that. And what I was doing is I was doing it because I wanted to show the salespeople 
before and after training, how things improve. And sometimes when, actually all the time, most of the time, when we're in the day to day, it's very tough to see improvements, right? I'll give you a personal story. When I was, when I finished my cancer treatment and I was, I got very ill from um, a bacteria and, and an infection in my throat. But when that infection was gone in April of 2023, um, I got to eat for the first time in about a year. And when I first started swallowing, it was like, it was so tough. And I was coughing and hacking and drinking like three liters of water to finish, finish a small plate of food. The, the barometer, the metric for what I had to eat was I had to finish my meal in under an hour um, without taking a break. And if I couldn't, then they wouldn't remove the G2, right? So you can imagine having something in your body that's feeding you for about a year, you want it out, right? And so when I first started eating, I was seeing improvements. Like every couple of days, it would be like, I wouldn't be able to swallow this. Now I'd be able to swallow it. And then I would choke four times or I'd choke 10 times. Now I'd choke eight times. And I was, I was keeping track of all of those metrics because I wanted to... Like knowing how we as humans operate, you forget last week at the end of the week. You forget the week before that. You forgot last month. And, and some of you might say, well, no, I don't forget last month. I closed two accounts. That's great. How many phone calls did you make? How many leads did you delete from your system or, or close out from your system? Like how many days, right? So these things we don't remember. And so I was keeping all these notes. And then once I started to have longer stints, of nothing happening, I stopped taking notes. And it's interesting because just last night, my wife and I were out for dinner and I started choking on the, like eating the food. I looked at her and I said, you know what? Like, I'm not getting any better. It's so frustrating. She goes, actually, honey, you're a million times better than you were a month ago. She goes, I, I, I sit beside you every day when you eat. I watch what's happening. So she, she's keeping track of those metrics. I stopped. So I stopped. And because I stopped, now I'm sitting there going, I have no baseline to continue my improvement on. So what did I do As of this morning? I started writing down my metrics again. So here's the thing. And here's where they say we can find value in no, right? Our research over the last 20 years has revealed the following fact. Top sales performers monitor multiple activity orient activity oriented metrics to measure their progress and productivity these activity or oriented metrics include crm data calls made calls returned email sent conversation with with prospects proposals sent follow ups scheduled meeting product demonstrations social media interactions and more now quick plug our software Bridger, the exclusive and built for logistics sales reps, has all of these metrics built in. So there we go. That was my plug. Um, so let's not forget the big one, nose gap. So what happened with this spreadsheet? And I know we're coming, we're coming up on time here, but what happened with this spreadsheet that I created is I was able to give sales reps a call versus close ratio how many leads they killed, how many leads they had to go through, how many calls they made a day. And we were in a very short trip, we're talking 90 days. We were able to see the trends of selling here, gap, closing, selling, gap, closing, because selling, fulfilling the why, closing the deal, right? And it all happened in these increments. And it was as vivid as day. And where it became really vivid is when I learned how to turn the data into a graph. Ooh, that was cool. And so now visually, salespeople, for the first time in my life, I got salespeople to see visually what's happening. And for me, that was enormous, enormous. And when I started doing that, everything changed. So if there is anything that I can suggest at this point, it's finding that metrics. And we'll go, in, we'll go into the next chapter real quick here because this next chapter actually gives you um, a couple of really cool tools, right? So I remember back, gosh, probably 2000, 2001, um, I realized each customer I landed was worth $2,000 a month. 
on average with my business. So what I did is I looked at it and I said, okay, well, how many calls do I make a month? So I went into my call logs and I looked at how many calls I made a month. And in the division, um, I think it was like $5 a call or something it, it came up to based on the closes and, and all that. So what I did is I went online, I printed a $5 bill and I taped it to the handset of my phone. And, and it reminded me every time I picked up that phone, now for all of you who watch and listen that may not know that, we used to have these big things on our desk called phones that had like all these lines on it and all these numbers on it. And you might not have seen those because you might be on your cell phone or whatever the case may be. But I would tape a five a fake five dollar bill that I printed off the internet. So every time I picked the phone, I would I would consider myself making five dollars on that sales call. And it's interesting because um, they go into a a piece in the back end of this uh, find the value where Lisa Jimenez, if you haven't connected with Lisa, she's awesome. Um, she would, her called close ratio would be 50 bucks. So she take a $50 bill to her phone. And it's a great way just to keep you motivated to make sales calls. It really is. Like if you use your cell phone, I would suggest you like um, tape a $5 bill or something to the top or fold it over, like find out where your call to close ratio is or any of that stuff and fold it over. So, Another way, see, in the key takeaway, when you get a no, you've made money because every no has value. I love that. Um, so another key takeaway here, and, and just we'll go into this one very quickly because um, then we're going to end the day. Ask, ask yourself if this is really a no. Um, in the section called Move the Bean, they talk about W. Clement Stone, who was an original mandate. He wrote a uh, success magazine. Um, you know, uh, success through a positive mental and him and Earl Nightingale, um, all those guys. And so what he did is he would take his, his big trick was take 20 pebbles, put them in one pocket or put them on one side of your desk. And as you make calls, you move the beans to the other side. So, so 20 beans and so you move the beans. So what he did is he gave 20 beans to all his salespeople and said, now you go out and sell every time you hear, no, you just take one bean, put it and then by the end of the 20th no you're going to get a sale so what it was is it's more of this visual thing for us as humans because it's like uh, okay well i got 20 let's just go through it so you get all of a sudden 10 or done you're like man i got 10 i only got 10 left by five and then it becomes a game right we're gamifying the idea of sales so i would suggest that that's an idea grab 20 well if it's skittles or anything like that you might need them but you know, 20 of something on your desk or 50 or whatever you want to make during the day and just start playing a game with yourself that moves things around. Um, I thought that was an absolutely awesome thing to add into there. Um, and they talk about why did this approach work for two reasons. It instilled faith that with every no, they were making progress and it kept them from quitting before a yes arrived. So I think that's super cool. Think of that system. Often. So I want to close off today with this. Ask yourself, is this really a no? So when I, you know, here's the one thing we hear from people is I get tons of no every day. I leave messages. They never get back. to me. Do you believe? So here's what Andrea and Richard, we don't believe that getting no's are what you think. Let me think about it is not a no. Voicemail, email, and or text messages that don't get a response are not a no. A direct, on, um, a direct message on social media that isn't answered isn't a no. Someone writing someone off as a no because they haven't responded or won't give you an answer is self-defeated. And this is the one thing I really love about this chapter is the, the idea that they're saying as salespeople, we often defeat ourselves before any quote unquote prospect defeats us. We, we defeat ourselves because we think if we send them a voicemail, they don't answer. It's a no. If we send them an email and they don't answer, it's a no. It, all of this, it's not a no. So um, once our simple, our, our rule for this is simple. For something to count as no, you must be sure that the person has heard or read your offer the person understands the offer and the person makes it clear they don't want what you're offering. Even then, it may not be a permanent no. It may be a no, not now or not yet. Sales technology expert, Ansi Narden says, salespeople are used to rejection, so used to rejection that we can see it even where it doesn't exist. 
ask yourself that. You know, think about 2023. A lot of you had so many challenges in 2023, so many. And you think some of them or some of those challenges, some of the, the no, some of the rejection that you feel you got was maybe a little made up. And I want to close with this. Think about your own buying behavior. Depending on the situation, the first no is often a knee-jerk reaction without much thought or consideration. Key takeaway, when you assume a non-response is a no, you are engaging in self-rejection. Now for me today, um, I think probably a really big, to me it was like just drinking out of a, a, a fire hose for most of you. Because if you haven't got these ideas, strategies, and structures together. Um, I'm going to encourage you to take the next couple of days. You know, we're sitting here Friday, December 29th. It's 5 to 11 Eastern. And we've got New Year's coming up. You know, the big thing in the New Year is, oh, you know, we're going to crush it now. We're going to crush it. But here's the thing. One thing that I've realized in my career, both in sales and owning businesses, in creating new businesses and in startups and building courses and in everything I've done. One thing I know is this, you have a system, right? In place. I'm gonna call it the vehicle that gets you from where you are to where you wanna be, whatever that may be. However far that distance may be, you there's a vehicle that's there. Now, if that vehicle fails, no matter how much effort you put in, no matter how good you are, you will fail. So invest in the vehicle that's going to get you to where you want to go. The processes, the structure, the software, all of these things encompass the vehicle, right? And the number one vehicle for you as a logistics sales rep is going to be tools that help you sell. And I know I plugged it at the beginning, but here's the one thing I'd really love for all of you to get out of this is Bridger. We built Bridger, myself and a team of professional logistics reps, all of which who've done well over a million dollars in GP a year, made tons of sales and been in the industry for decades. We understand what systems, AKA the vehicle you need to get things done. We're offering a 30 day special in the show notes. Go over, check it out, because if you're looking for the vehicle that's going to hold up and get you over the mountains you need to get over to achieve your goals and dreams in 2024, Bridger is the vehicle for you. You want to talk about measuring cold calls, measuring meetings, measuring emails. Measure, it does it all instantly for you, all in the back end, visual. You open it up and you say, this is exactly where I'm at. So I encourage you to go and grab that now. Get it. If you don't want it, here's a secondary option for you. Sit down. Take the next 48, 72 hours and sit down and create the vehicle, the processes, the structure. Find the software that's all going to go into this vehicle to get you exactly where you need to go in 2024. Because again, a lot of the times it's not you, it's not your drive, it's not your motivation, it's the vehicles that fail you. And a lot of companies don't invest in the right vehicles. And for all you company owners out there, I'm sorry, but it's true. A lot of companies don't invest in the right vehicles for salespeople, right? A vehicle is sales training. A vehicle is systems that keep up with your motivation, your drive, your desire, and your goal to achieve, okay? Those are your vehicles. That's all for today, my friends. Go out there, make every conversation educational, crush your sales and enjoy the end of 2023. Thank the Lord. Goodbye. We're into 2024. Take care.